<laughs> so, as this proceeded, we now got to about 1990, it had become possible to begin to do experiments of the sort that I was doing in the snail in the mouse. Now, the mouse is like a person, it's not necessarily Austrian, but it's, you know, like a <laughs> half person. And um, people had developed techniques for genetically modifying mice, so you could call the gene expression. And we began to look at the hippocampus again. That people had not stood still. A lot of people had moved into the hippocampus since I left it. A lot of progress had been made. People showed that the synapses in the hippocampus sh changed very much like the synapses in the prison. And we began to look at the molecular underpinnings, and although there are differences in detail, the principles are exactly the same in complex forms of learning than they are in simple forms of learning. For short-term memory, you have a functional change without any growth of new connect uh, connections, but long-term memory, the psychic gain p-dependent protein kinase moves into the nucleus, it activates the same activated genes, it's called PREP, and that turns on the growth of new synaptic connections. Now, the nice thing about mice is that mice you can also use for models of human disease, and we've looked at a number of models, we've looked at uh, aspects of memory defect with schizophrenia, and we've also looked at memory defects associated with aging. Mice don't get Alzheimer's disease spontaneously, the way people do. You can put a gene, a mutated gene for Alzheimer's into them, but they don't develop it spontaneously. But they develop an age-related memory loss. So about 60% of, of mice, as they age, have a mild progressive decrease in the memory, very much like people. People is about 60%. And people, of the 60%, almost half go on to Alzheimer's disease, but a significant amount, more than 30%, just develop a, a, a mild, slightly progressive weakening of memory with age. We looked at what was going on in those mice biochemically, and we found there was, in fact, a decrease in the psychic AMP system. And when we elevated the level of psychic AMP, those animals were like adolescents. Their memory was restored to normal. So if you're a mouse, we can do a lot for you. People, we're not sure. <laughs> we, we have I started a company with a number of colleagues called Memory Pharmaceuticals, and those drugs are beginning to emerge in clinical trials. And lots of people are trying to develop drugs like this. Um, so let me conclude by giving you some philosophical um, ideas that, that sort of impressed me over the years. One is that um, I can't think of a life that is more fulfilling than an academic <coughs> life. Uh, I've enjoyed my career as a, uh, an academic uh, at, at Columbia in particular, enormously. And I particularly find life in science extremely rewarding. And those of you who have any hesitation about this, I would urge you to just jump in and do it. It's fantastically rewarding. Most of us don't know the difference between work and play because there is such satisfaction in doing work. And not to say there are not many disappointments, a lot of experiments don't work. But the idea of doing something new, of thinking about the problems, of hanging around with young people all the time is really quite invigorating. And the other thing is, uh, what about my relationship to Austria? Uh, my relationship to Austria is complex. Uh, as a result of Andrea and Hans Fischer, we used to work with, uh, Fischer worked for Andreas, of course. <laughs> uh, I've come to feel much more comfortable uh, in Austria, although I still sense residual aspects of anti-Semitism there. Um, but there are residual aspects of anti-Semitism all over the world, so uh, Austria is not unique with that. But I do think that Austria has had difficulty until the current generation of being as transparent with its past as it should be. I spent a lot of time in Germany, and in part because Germany's had a different history, in fact we can discuss that, it is remarkably transparent. And I must say that one cannot ask more of a country than Germany has done in terms of making its past clear to everyone. Going back, for example, the Max Planck Gesellschaft examined its books to show how it was actually carrying out research with people working with concentration. Amazing. They did no, no attempt at cover up. In Austria, Austrians specialize in cover up. This is the way life is led. So therefore, forgive me for saying this, but <laughs> I, I, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, so I give you one example, a trivial example that Andreas and I are involved with. Uh, 
the University of Vienna, the Citadel of Knowledge in Austria, sits on the Ringstraße. Do you know what the name of the part of the ring that the university sits on is called? See this? Yes. Luego. And you know who Luego was? Yes. Luego was the anti Semitic mayor of Vienna around 1895 to about 1905, who realized that anti Semitism is a fantastically effective political platform. And Hitler writes in my camp, I've learned more from Luego than from anybody else. Um, and I have agitated with extremely expert help uh, to try to change the name of that part of it. There is a Luega Platz. I have no issue. Let them have a Platz. But to have the university, <laughs> have the university sit on the Luega ring, I find unacceptable. The university wants to change it to university ring. And we've agreed because people say, well, the mailing address of the people to the left or the right and the other side of the street is going to be screwed up. Let that part of the ring be called the ring. Let only free up the little stretch that the university sits on. Let's call that uh, university ring. Uh, and people have volunteered to pay the expenses for new stationery for the university ring. So, <laughs> but do you think this has happened? No. Even though sympathetic people, Hopeful, for example, who I like a great deal, is a fantastic guy, uh, Mayor of Vienna. He whispered in my ear when I became an honorary citizen of the city of Vienna that um, he thinks that my, this might work. When I wrote him eight or nine months later and I said, any progress? He said, you know, I just thought about it a little bit. You know, it's not so bad that if you name something after somebody who's done bad things. Because if you're there and you see the name, you think about the bad things as well as the good things. This is typical baby Schmidt, right? This is Schmidt. This is so I, I wrote to him saying it's the job of the textbooks, the history books, to point out the evil and the good. If you name something, you're honoring. So that is one thing that any one of you could sort of help us with. I would be very grateful. There is a larger issue, and you, of course, referred to that. I'm involved in several Viennese scientific organizations, and I must tell you that when I first back, came back to Vienna around 1970, the science in Vienna was unbelievably boring. I mean, when I used to give lectures, not only did the audience fall asleep, but I fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> this has changed. Science in Vienna is extremely good now. Uh, but there are practically no Jews. There are some, but there are practically no Jews. First of all, there are very few Jews in Vienna. When I was in Vienna, Vienna had close to 200,000 Jews. There are now 7,000 that are legally registered, maybe another 7,000, so at most 14,000 Jews. So I think it would be wonderful if Vienna were more receptive for Jews, if they actively invited some, and I would particularly eager to have scholars come back to Vienna and to reestablish the environment in Vienna that we had in the good old days, they were never quite that good, but they certainly better than they were in the Hitler era, in which Jews and non-Jews worked together extremely effectively. Like look at Vienna 1900, what a magnificent year. And the distinction was the obvious one. I mean, people were aware of who they were, but they worked together in a very effective way. So I think, you know, your generation is the generation that can carry this forward. We can give you some ideas, but you need to develop your own ideas on this, and I really hope that Vienna will assume, Austria as a whole, will assume a major leadership role as a progressive nation in Middle Europe. They'll provide an example for other countries of how people can live together. So anyway, pleasure to be here. I'd be delighted to answer any questions that you have, as long as they're not very difficult. Thank you very much. <laughs>
that act on nerve cells to alter the expression of genes. Uh, and learning experience is a very effective one. Hormones are another very effective way of doing it. But you're absolutely right, gene changes occur. Now, you ha I have to admit one thing clear, which I probably didn't. These gene changes are not mutations in the gene. So these are not the kinds of mutations that give rise to disease states, alterations in the DNA sequence or the protein sequence. These are changes in the level in which the gene operates. Yes. Well, I understand uh, you speak about memory as an intellectual exercise. Is that right? As an exercise. Yeah. As an exercise. exercise. Yeah. How about smell? I have an idea. I smell a, a special, a special smell, and immediately I have a memory of Eisenstadt uh, uh, 1953. That's a wine. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> you make a very good point. This is a Proustian point. Proust made the point that when he dipped his madeleine into the tea. The aroma brought his whole childhood experience out. There are our sense organs are fantastic triggers of our memory. So many people you remember visual cues. I mean I remember this building from the outside, I can close my eyes and then remember it. So sensory experience is very powerful in bringing back memory and smell is very, very powerful in doing it. Then it gets into the brain where everything gets into the brain. You and I having a conversation, our brains are talking to one another. I mean, this is one of the, you know, one of the basic insights of all of modern biology that has been around now for some time, is that every act that you engage in, from the most trivial reflex act, hitting a backhand in tennis, to the most creative act of writing a, you know, a symphony, are brain processes. And these are mediated by nerve cells acting through synapses and they're controlled by gene expression. Now, um, first of all... Is it the psychoanalytic of each name? Are you? Nein, aber ich studiere natürlich psychoanalytic. Sie sagen es natürlich, als jeder muss das tun. Would this be the name of my German? Yeah. I've sh shown you all my German. <laughs> <laughs> what a great pleasure to have you change us this evening, first of all. Uh, secondly, I, uh, I teach film, and um, when I'm often wondering what happens to the youngsters who grow up with this rapid succession of uh, this amazing speed with which they are confronted with the images constantly and I, having absolutely no knowledge in your field it still concerns me a lot could you it concerns me about? also i mean we, there's no question we're going for a revolution of how we handle information comparable probably to the discovery of the gutenberg press the, the printing press uh and it's difficult to know there's no question the mental processes of younger people is going to be different than ours. For example, uh, we used to memorize telephone numbers. It's absurd. No one memorizes. You can so, I mean, you can Google everything. So, we probably will move from having, you know, sort of powerful memories in our head to having facility with devices that allow us to access to enormous sources of information. That's a completely different scale. Now, obviously, we're going to lose some things, but we may also gain some things. New kinds of intelligence come around. Uh, people of my generation have a great deal of difficulty multitasking, you know, to do several things at the same time. In fact, it's dangerous for anyone to drive and do anything else. But the fact is, people do this all the time, and even though it's stupid to do it, they get away with it to a surprise. I don't mean that they're caught, but they're successful in doing it. Uh, so, Younger people can do things that, that our generation would, would never even try in a serious way. Uh, so these are different skills, but obviously I think something is going to be different. Now, I think it's going to be very important to study the outcome of this, because we may want to reverse it. We may want to say there's too much of this. Mm -hmm. 